I want to start this morning and share a story. Um, there was a woman by the name of uh, Cicely Saunders. Cicely Saunders. She was a, a British nurse and a social worker, but later she trained to become a doctor. And what she discovered in 1950s England is that hospitals had no idea what to do with patients who were dying. Doctors would tell the family, there's nothing more that can be done, and nothing more was done for the suffering person. Now, Cicely Saunders became a Christian, and she refused to accept that. She spent seven years researching pain control and working amongst people who were dying. She began dreaming of a place, serving cancer patients, but she was afraid of stepping out and asking for finances for what would be the, hosp the world's first purpose, hospice care. Then one day she read Psalm 37.5. It says, commit thy way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. So in 1961, Cicely Saunders opened St. Christopher's in London. It was there where they did pioneering research using morphine for pain control. And unlike hospitals, in her hospice, a patient could garden or get their hair done or enjoy art therapy, music therapy, drama therapy. Cicely believed you matter because you matter to the last moment of your life. Her work helped create a new specialty in medicine. Anyone ever heard of palliative care? This is where it comes from. And when euthanasia, which is supposedly called death with dignity, that's really what euthanasia is, it, it, it began to grow in Europe. Cicely Saunders strongly opposed it because of her Christian faith. And because she had shown that effective pain control was possible. In 2005, Cicely Saunders actually died from cancer at the very hospice she had started. In a culture that viewed a dying patient as a medical failure, Cicely Saunders taught the whole world how to view the same patient as a whole person. Folks, everyone is someone. Everyone matters. We're going to continue through this story of Nehemiah. Nehemiah building broken walls this morning. I want to take us through chapter 5 of Nehemiah. And we've come to a critical point, another critical point. There seem to be several of them through the book of Nehemiah. And this is the point at which it becomes crystal clear. Nehemiah sees that those who are here in Judah, who, where he is rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, they are so much more than just a means to an end. They're so much more than just a work crew. Nehemiah sees those who've come to rebuild and restore as part of a community that needs to be and must be prioritized in terms of being cared for with an ever-deepening compassion. Here's the thing I want you to walk away with this morning. Folks, when we engage in the work that God calls us to, we must remember that it is not simply about getting the job done. We are called to see people the way that God sees people and love people the way that God loves people. Because see, the work of rebuilding demanded much of Nehemiah and the work of rebuilding and restoring, it's going to demand much of us. But at the same time, we cannot simply just bury ourselves in the work and forget about the reality of everyone around us. And that's why the first thing I want you to really take note of this morning is Nehemiah had a problem. Nehemiah has a problem here in chapter 5. Uh, beginning in verse 1. Now, the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, we're mortgaging our fields, our, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during a famine. 
still others were saying, we've had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. And although we're of the same flesh and blood as our fellow Jews, and though our children are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery? Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. Then Nehemiah says this, when I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. The problem here is a significant problem, folks. We are seeing that even while this incredibly difficult and dangerous task of rebuilding the broken walls of Jerusalem is taking place, and while there's people who oppose that work and they continue to threaten the lives of those doing the work, there seems to be, based on what we're reading here in chapter 5, there's an even more insidious threat that's brewing within and among all of those people who are carrying out this work of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. There is a significant economic crisis brewing and growing among the people who've gathered to tell Nehemiah exactly what's going on. They're exhausted. They're no doubt stressed out people. They're gathering. We're told men and women to share the truth about what's happening. And frankly, frankly, these things may have been going on well before the rebuilding work actually began. But this work is bringing to light even deeper issues and problems among those who are living in the land. And there's clearly an effort here to take advantage of the people. People are telling Nehemiah about such things as starvation. Uh, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. He's talking about, they're talking about manipulative lending practices. The other day I walked by a, 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 one of those, um, what do they call them? Day loans or what are those places called? Where you get a loan and you just walk in. I can't remember what they're Payday loans. Yeah, y'all know what I'm talking about. Manipulative lending practices. We're, we're mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, our homes to get grain during the famine. There's excessive taxation. Excessive taxation. We've had to borrow money. Borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. What did they just say about their fields and vineyards? You just, what did they just say about those fields and vineyards, though? Giving them some, and they still got to pay taxes on them. They tell Nehemiah about forced slavery. We have been subject, we've had to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we're powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. Now, friends, make sure you get this. That Nehemiah is absolutely listening and hearing truly disturbing news because he's told in verse 5, he's told in verse 5, although we are of the same flesh and blood as our fellow Jews, do you, get what, do you get what they're saying there? There's people among them that are taking advantage of them. People who are from their community who are taking advantage of them. And he says, although they're saying, and they say, although our children are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Folks, these kinds of practices are the very, very things that in the past, they, they culminated in Israel ending up being conquered by surrounding nations and being led into exile. They've done this kind of stuff before, and it's led to problems for the nation of Israel. It's led to problems. They've been taken out of the land that's theirs because they've done this before. In reading through the Old Testament, there's actually provision. There is provision for slavery. However, what we see taking place here in Nehemiah 5, it's manipulative, and it doesn't really line up with the law given by Moses. As a matter of fact, later on in the book of Nehemiah, a reminder is given about the importance of obeying the law. Chapter 10, verse 29. Nehemiah says, All those now join their fellow Israelites, the nobles, and bind themselves with a curse and an oath to follow the law of God, given through Moses, the servant of God, and to obey carefully all the commands, regulations, and decrees of the Lord. 
It seems that there are those among the people, they're making profit off of their financial difficulties and hardships. It's unconscionable and it's unacceptable. Did you know there's apparently a stigma attached to carrying credit card debt? Did you know that? In our, in our nation, there's a stigma. More than a third of Americans say they would be embarrassed to let others know that they're not paying off their credit card debt in, in full, in full every month. More than 40% say they feel they'll be judged by family and friends because of credit card debt. The surprising thing is that Americans' average credit card debt is over one, anybody want to take a guess? The average credit card debt of an American right now? Ah, that's a really good guess, but not quite that high. Getting closer. It's about between fifteen and twenty thousand dollars, average. That's average. So forty thousand dollars, not outside of the realm of possibility. That's average. An executive for the firm that completed the survey said, "He said it's no surprise that shame about debt isn't necessarily productive." in preventing or eradicating it. Shame doesn't guarantee success. And these people are feeling the weight of shame. The only way to pay off debt is to face it head on and make a plan to get rid of it. And the people are coming to Nehemiah and saying, we're being, we're being punished. Nehemiah's got a problem. I would say one more thing about that. And there are folks in our day and age, they're also... Like I said, they're, they're engaged in taking advantage of the financial hardships that a lot of us face. These folks know that we have a problem, and they found a way to monetize our problem. And here in the book of Nehemiah, while the work of rebuilding the wall is indeed getting done, there's an outcry, not only from the threat of the surrounding hostile neighbors, but there's an enemy from within that threatens to destroy the rebuilding. Nehemiah's got a problem. Thus we read in verse 6, Nehemiah says, When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I'd like to think that Nehemiah was a little bit like Dr. Bruce Banner. Anybody ever heard of Dr. Bruce Banner? Does that name sound familiar? Dr. Bruce Banner, the transformational character from the Marvel comics, the Hulk. Ever heard of him? He had a phrase that went something like this, Don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. And I suspect maybe some of that's going on in Nehemiah. We, we read about him being very angry. With the financial realities of the people now laid bare, the word is out that those who are behaving in ways that are contradictory to the law and what the law demands for the nation and the people of Israel, something has to be done. Something has to change. People must be seen the way that God sees them. The way that God sees his people. So here is a Nehemiah's solution. And I'm going to read some specific verses where we see Nehemiah begin to point to his solution. The very first thing is that Nehemiah in these following verses calls for is dealing with reality as it is. In verse 7, he says, I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. I told them, you're charging your own people interest. Verse 8, as far as possible, we've brought back our fellow Jews who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you are selling your own people only for them to be sold back to us? Verse 9, so I continued, what you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? Let me just pause right there. What he's saying is, do you know how bad this makes us look in the eyes of our enemies? This is just giving them ammunition to think that we are even worse than, than, than anyone else has ever been. Verse 11, he says, now, 
But let us stop charging interest, give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses, and also the interest you are charging them. In other words, Nehemiah is saying, give it all back, every penny, and give the stuff back that you took. Verse 13, and this is very important. I want you to, I want you to know what we read here is critically important. He says, I also shook out the folds of my robe and said, in this way, may God shake out of their house and possessions anyone who does not keep this promise, so may such a person be shaken out and emptied. In other words, Nehemiah is saying, God's going to jack you up if you don't do what's right. And you don't do it right now. Make it right. I believe the fact that Nehemiah speaks these things out loud, it's critical to addressing the problem. How will you ever truly know what the problems might be unless you say things out loud? Especially for the people in the back. Y'all can't hear me? I'm going to just say it louder. Say it louder. Say it louder. Now, I do think it's wise. I need to make a comment here and be mindful of something. That's a very real thing. Compassion fatigue. Have you ever heard that phrase? Compassion fatigue. Does that sound familiar? It's a real thing. In other words, there is an absolute cost for caring for others. And I wonder if at some point this, maybe this didn't happen with Nehemiah. It's certainly possible. And while it makes the observation of Anglican priest and theologian John Stott difficult to hear, it doesn't make it any less true. Stott says this, he says, Only as we become more aware of the extent of human need are we likely to make a specific response and to do something about these huge global injustices of our time. To take it a step further, the deal with the reality of their situation. Nehemiah, in verse 13 of chapter 5, he, he calls together a, a meeting of a group that probably would have been considered like the movers and the shakers of 5th century B.C. Israel. These are, these are the people who, if they had a Wall Street, they would have been the ones occupying the top floors. Look at verse 12, Nehemiah 5. We read, Then I summoned the priests, and made the nobles and officials take an oath to do what they had promised. I suspect it was, there's a part of me that's like thinking, it's a little bit where Nehemiah puts an arm behind the back and says, you're going to do it, right? You're going to do it because it's the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do. Nehemiah is calling them out. He calls them out in public. He's telling them to do what's right and to do it now. Don't wait. Don't wait. This is his solution. Don't wait. Do it now. In September of 1940, Witold Pilecki, or Witold Pilecki, he was a Polish army captain. He did the unthinkable in 1940. He snuck into Auschwitz. He snuck into Auschwitz. You've heard of Auschwitz. It's a place of horror. And, but he snuck in. Pilecki knew that something was terribly wrong with the concentration camp, and as a committed Roman Catholic Christian and a Polish patriot, he couldn't just sit by and watch. Does anyone know where Auschwitz is located? In what country? Poland. So he sees this happening in his own country. He wanted to get the information on the horrors of Auschwitz, but he knew he could only do it from the inside. So his superiors kind of set up this plan. They provided him a false identity card with a Jewish name, and then Pilecki allowed the Germans to arrest him during a routine Warsaw Street roundup. Pilecki was sent to Auschwitz and assigned an inmate number of 4859. Pilecki was the husband and the father of two, and he said later, I bade farewell to everything I had known on this earth. He became just like any other prisoner, despised, beaten, and threatened with death. From inside the camp, he wrote this. He said, the game I was now playing at Auschwitz was dangerous. In fact, I had gone far beyond what people in the real world would consider dangerous. But beginning in 1941, 
Prisoner number 4859 started working on his dangerous mission. He, he organized his inmates into resistance units, boosting morale and documenting war crimes. Pilecki used couriers to smuggle out detailed reports on the atrocities. By 1942, he had also helped organize a secret radio station using scrap parts. The information he supplied from inside the camp provided Western allies with key intelligence information about Auschwitz. By the spring of 1943, how long has this guy been in camp now? He's been in the camp three years. Three years, and Pilecki joined the camp bakery where he was able to overpower a guard and escape. Once free, he finished his report estimating that around two million souls had been killed at Auschwitz. Two million. That's two-thirds of the population of the city of Chicago in one camp. When the reports reached London, officials thought he was exaggerating, but of course today we know he was right. Here's how a contemporary Jewish journal summarized Pilecki's life. Once he set his mind to the good, he never wavered, he never stopped, he crossed the great human divide that separates knowing the right thing from doing the right thing. In his report, Pilecki said, there's always a difference between saying you will do something and actually doing it. A long time before, many years before, I had worked on myself in order to be able to fuse the two. The Polish ambassador to the United States described Pilecki as a diamond among Poland's heroes. Friends, as we come to the conclusion, this portion of the story, the rebuilding of the broken walls of Jerusalem, there's one more thing I want to, I, I really need to draw your attention to. This is critical. Beginning in Nehemiah, verse 5, verse 14, and I apologize if it's a little difficult to read. If it is, please just listen closely. Nehemiah is speaking here. He says, moreover, from the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when I was appointed to the governor in the land of Judah until his 32nd year, 12 years altogether, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allotted to the governor. But the earlier governors, those preceding me, Nehemiah, placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. Their assistants also lorded it over the people. But out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. All my men were assembled there for the work. We did not acquire any land. Furthermore, 150 Jews and officials ate at my table, as well as those who came to us from the surrounding nations. Each day, one ox, six choice sheep, and some poultry were prepared for me, and every ten days an abundant supply of wine, all kinds. In spite of this, I never demanded the food allotted to the governor because the demands were heavy on these people. Remember me with favor, my God, for all I've done for these people. Friends, Nehemiah sets the proper Example, for all the people by beginning with himself. His own lifestyle exemplifies what he called those priests to, those nobles and those officials to model, to live as well. <clears throat> it was not enough. <clears throat> it is never enough simply to call people to live the life that God calls them to leave. Because as Nehemiah's example shows, if we are calling people to it, we need to live it as well. Saul and Pilar Cruz were this married couple, and they worked at this ministry in Mexico City called Armonia Ministries. And they launched their ministry by, camp, by, by launching a, a camp at the edge of a very large and vast garbage dump. And if you know anything about 
Um, there's lots of cities around the world where on the edge of those very large cities, there are these huge garbage dumps where people live. And starting the church, Saul uh, and his wife started this church and it had its challenges. In particular, the people there had a difficult time trusting Saul's leadership. Although Saul was a gifted strategist and thinker, he often kind of appeared aloof. By his own admission at this point, Saul was unwilling to plunge into the pain and the poverty of all his people. But all that changed one Sunday morning when someone burst into their worship service with a frantic need. The local sewage system has started leaking and then flooding the streets. As sewage continued to gush, the street was on the verge of collapse. The crisis threatened to sweep away dozens of nearby homes. And to make matters worse, the city wouldn't respond for at least three days. So think about this. These people have to live in sewage until the city gets around to cleaning it up. Saul and a local engineer organized the onlookers and the church members to stop traffic, make sandbags. After working frantically for nearly 15 hours, by 3 o'clock the next morning, they'd finally stopped the flow of the sewage. It was cold and drizzling, and Saul was shivering. Exhausted and covered with mud and sewage, Saul and his church members emerged from the pit. They walked back to the church. But some of the women had heated water so that the volunteers could, could wash off the filth. And as they gathered together, Saul started to cry. I'm sorry, he said, but I need to pray. I need to thank God because he just saved us. He saved you. He saved me. Can we pray? Then Saul put out his hands as they all hand, held hands together and knelt to pray. By the time they had finished praying, Saul had earned their trust, becoming their leader and their friend. Later, later Saul would comment, people need to see you're for real, that you really care for them, that you're even ready to put your life on the edge for them. Saul Cruz modeled precisely what Nehemiah has done in this account from Nehemiah chapter 5. They both demonstrate with their very lives that the work of God includes seeing people the way God sees them. It's exactly what Jesus has done as well. When Jesus gave his life as a ransom for many, and that ransom for many, includes you, and you, and you, and you. Nehemiah's problem caused, called for caring for people the way that God cares for them is a challenge for us as well. Would you pray with me? God, doing this work that you have called us to, Lord, it will demand much. Lord, and there may be circumstances and situations where folks in engaging in the work, Lord, they, maybe they feel that they're not being seen. Maybe the work is, is having an impact on them in some other way that we may not know of. God, I pray that you would help us, even as we have set our hearts and minds, to follow your call, to follow your lead, to do and to be like Nehemiah, or that we would actually live what we say we believe, even as we engage in the work that you've called us to. We love you. We thank you. Because you, you model that for us as well, through the person and the work of Jesus. In whose name we pray, amen.